I'm not a murderer, but I want justice. Our mission commander, an expert on the inner workings of Camino, was a young bounty hunter named Boba Fett. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will cover each and every detail from the life of Boba Fett. From before his birth to his legacy after death, stories from dozens of comics, novels, shows, and movies over the decades. If you like this video, please hit the like button to help promote it, and subscribe so you don't miss anything, as this will be a multi-part epic saga on the complete legend of Boba Fett. The course of Boba's life was set long before he was born. Decades before the first clone was created on Kamino, the Mandalorians were deep into their latest civil war. The new Mandalorians were the pacifists, and were the largest and most politically powerful faction, enabling them to take the throne of Mandalore. But within the warrior Mandos, there was even further fracturing, splitting into Death Watch led by Vizsla, and the true Mandalorians led by Jasta Muriel. Jango Fett was just a boy when the civil war brought death and destruction to his homeworld of Concord Dawn. Jango's mother and father were beaten and executed, while his sister was captured, twisted into a weapon, and driven insane, before being left to rot in an asylum. Boba would be able to get away, and ran straight into the arms of Jasta Muriel. And over the years, he would grow to be the most respected Mandalorian amongst the ranks. But his adoptive father would be cut down on what was supposed to be a routine mission, making Jango the Mandalore, before he would eventually lose all of his men and become a bounty hunter. And decades later, Jango's closest friend, a Toydarian bounty broker named Roz, was able to identify a lot of Jango's psychological hang-ups. You ever think maybe you hang onto that ship? Those memories, because you're looking for someone to take under your own wing. And shortly after this conversation, he would lose her as well, Roz's dying words encouraging him to find meaning. Just find something, something to live for besides the money. You deserve more. Moments later, he would complete the bounty placed by Lord Tyrannus, which had the dual purpose of finding one worthy of being the clone template. This is just moments after Roz's death, and Django is adamant that he wants the first clone to be unaltered in any way, and to be given to him. This child would become Jaster's legacy. Before he was even born, the mantle of Mandalore was placed on Boba. Under Django's rule as Mandalore, all of the true Mandalorians had died in an epic battle with the Jedi, and he desperately wanted to ensure that that honorable warrior culture, which had saved him and given his life purpose, did not blink out of existence with his own death. Boba would be the final hope for the Mandalorian people. In 32 BBY, Boba Fett would be spawned in the Kaminoan labs, and while his altered brothers would grow at twice the rate, Jango would balance raising his infant and an army. Years would go by, and we can see how difficult it was for Boba to have this single and incredibly busy parent, as Jango was still taking bounties, and the boy was often raised by various droids and sometimes the Kaminoan Tan Wee. He would have no friends his age, and did not attend anything like a school, but he was a voracious, self-guided learner, simply pulling whatever data pads he wished from the Kaminoan library, especially on the mechanics of starfighters. And though his father was drawn by so many forces, they still had an excellent relationship. Young Boba loved to play starfighters with his father, and was always keeping an eye out for Slave One, rushing out into the soaking rain to jump up into his father's arms. And Jango was known to tell Cal Scarada, one of the sergeants he had training the clones, that Boba was worth more to him than all of the credits and reputation that he had earned. And when Zam Wazel wanted to get Jango to help him on a mission of conscious, not credits, she knew to pull on the strings of fatherhood getting Jango to help save Coruscant by making the professional killer think about how many sons like Boba were on that world. You can honestly say that Coruscant may have been destroyed if it wasn't for how Jango was transformed by this love of his son. By the time Boba was 10 years old, we see that he was deep into his warrior training. On an unidentified planet, he would be strapped into a jetpack and sprayed with the scent of a local prey animal. A bit of flying practice as he had to evade the enormous bay leg by zipping around in a cave and break off its tooth before he could leave. Boba was panicked, confused, and angry, but what mattered most was that he was successful. His father tells him that he was forced to trust his instincts and reactions, having no time for fear. And since he had taken on the largest and most frightening monster in the galaxy, he should never be afraid of any other being. Moments later, we would see how Jango wanted to include his son on every aspect of the business, telling Dooku to speak freely in front of the boy. And we see just how fiercely proud Wobo was of his father, yelling at the Count that his dad was more dangerous than any target out there. Once they do get to the location, Boba is happily surprised to hear that he will be the one taking the shot. 
though he is confused why they don't just burst in with brute force. Django stresses that the Beleg Cave and this hit are different situations that need different methods. Always try to use the least confrontational method when possible. Boba would patiently stare down the scope until his target came home. Calmly, he would pull the trigger, sending the perfectly placed bolt that collided with the Mark's helmet. But it did not kill the man, forcing Django to fly in and finish the fight. A battle that would reveal that their target was a runaway clone. Django is stunned, but knows if he is to be the sole ruler, the Mandalore, he needs to be strong enough to pull the blaster on himself, blowing away the man who shared his face. When his father returns, Boba can sense that something is off, scared at how his powerful dad could be this shaken. As they pull away, Django says that Boba could pilot the Slave One, and that one day he would explain what it had so disturbed him. The next mission would teach Boba the art of deception, as they were contracted to eliminate rebels on Kua. Boba would stumble into their camp, fainting to be weak and lost. In front of these blaster-wielding warriors, he would stall, until he revealed a thermal detonator, his father's words in his mind as he chucks the explosive into the camp and runs back into another tent, huddled there while Django blasts away all the rebel forces. But their leader discovers Boba and has a fearful but honest conversation with him, explaining how the overlords of Kuat were oppressing the people, and even his own son had been consumed by their industrial machine that reduced people to replaceable cogs. But Boba recants some of Django's wisdom as he waits, that he should never be concerned with politics or emotions. When Django arrives, the rebel puts a blaster to Boba's head. But when the boy says, quote, only a son can know his father's heart, the man releases Boba, but Django snatches his son up and tosses an explosive at the leader, the blast consuming the tent as they soar away via jetpack. Boba feels bad for the man and asks his father why, while he also knows that his father will not explain anything until the mission was completed. When Django reports in to Count Dooku, we see that the Sith was interested in the boy's progress as a warrior, having his own plans for the future of Fett and we see Boba struggling with the morality of this profession. He explains to his father that this man was simply defending his son's honor, and the countless sons of Kua, and Django agrees that he was right to look into the motives of his target, but that his only loyalty is to his word. Once you had committed to an action, the battlefield will leave no room for mercy. Boba thinks to himself that he knows what his father's heart contained. It was also his heart, understanding that this was the way of the warrior. But their next mission together would have a setback. Tyrannus had contacted Django to capture a hut that was orchestrating a takeover of the Fondor system, a system that contained the great Fondor shipyards, which would play a useful role in the Clone Wars and under Imperial rule. Django allowed his son to accompany him, but the boy was captured by the rival hunters Kratosk and Bosk. Though Fett was able to get Boba back, he was so shaken by this mission that he cut it short in order to take him back to Kamino, calling on Zamazel to follow up on his leads. His father would have one more mission after this before being contracted to eliminate Senator Padme Amidala. Kenobi would be able to track Django down to Kamino, and it would be a young Boba that opens the door to the Fett suite. The closest thing he could ever compare to a mother was Tan Wei, and she was happy to introduce the Jedi to the clone template. But we see the boy already disdained these sorcerers, giving Kenobi a harsh look over before letting him in. As Django finds a way to avoid the root of the Jedi's every question, Boba looks on entranced, trying to learn this form of verbal warfare, giving up answers without giving any information, before his dad tells him to shut the door to the armory, speaking to him in their Fett code language. Oh, Boba, who did so he... It would be more conversational combat, and as the Jedi leaves, Boba can sense that his dad is truly worried. What is it, Dad? Pack your things. We're leaving. He would have only a few minutes to pack up and leave the only home he had ever known, rushing off to one of the rain-covered platforms to load up the Slave One. But they are intercepted by the Jedi. Dad, no! Boba, get on board! Though he was only 10 years old, he was trained enough in the warrior ways to hop right into the fight, whipping the Slave One around to blast at this sorcerer. The father-son team provided an incredible challenge to Kenobi, while the boy looked on proudly while Django delivered his blows, eventually returning to the platform victorious. They would take off and set a course for Geonosis, but Obi-Wan was hot on their trail, and it is the young co-pilot that notices the Delta-7 fighter first. Dad! I thought we'd been tracked! There was not a shred of worry in the boy, fully confident in his father's piloting skills and Slave One's power. As the Jedi is greeted with the glorious seismic charge, then the furious streams of laser cannons and seeming to end the fight with a missile, before the Fets made their way down to the surface. Dooku had come to expect the young boy at the professional killer's side, and Boba would be with his father as they headed to the Petronaki arena. The Jedi had survived the battle in orbit, but Tyrannus assured Jango that the Jedi and the senator that he was contracted to kill 
would all die to the cheers of thousands of Geonosians. But things did not go as planned, and the greatest bounty hunter in the galaxy was snuck up on by Mace Windu, Boba looking on helplessly as the purple blade was just millimeters from his father's neck. While his father was calm, just waiting for the opportunity to escape. And salvation came in the form of B2 battle droids. As they opened fire, Jango stepped aside and blasted with his flamethrower, Boba trying to process the chaos that had just erupted in the arena. He would see his father defend the Count with some blasts from his powerful West R 34s, and when Jango saw Mace being pursued by a Reek, he flies down via jetpack and sees that the beast had knocked the Jedi's lightsaber free. Perhaps out of a wish to kill the Jedi with his own saber, something that would certainly add to his infamy, he forgoes simply shooting the wizard, instead he leaps out to grab the blade. But the Force was a slippery foe. Mace calls the weapon back to his hand and confidently rises to face Fed. The Mandalore's error was compounded by the charging Reek, but Boba looked on as his father killed this monster and was eager to see the death of this Jedi. But Jango did not notice that his jetpack had been severely damaged. And though he wished to use the move that helped him to get the high ground against Kamari Vosa and Kenobi, when he activated the jets, they short-circuited, providing only a poof of smoke, while Mace moved through his lightsaber form seamlessly. And Bobo looks on as his father is decapitated, his head flying out of the helmet and onto the first battlefront of the Clone Wars. Dooku was shocked, but Bobo was absolutely devastated, losing the only friend and only family that he had ever known. With the death of his father, Boba's previous life ended as well. As the battle moved on, he'd make his way into the arena and stare into the helmet that came to symbolize his father, the last of the true Mandalorians. And in that instant, he knew what he had to become, gathering up the armor and burying his father in a simple grave in the arena, leaving only the humble letters J.F. drawn in the sand. The end to the greatest Mandalore in thousands of years. Boba knew he would have to carry on his father's legacy, Jaster's legacy in the warrior code of the Mandalorians. But first, he was set on getting his revenge on Mace Windu. And to guide him, he would refer to a book that his father left him in Slave One. A book Jango composed in order to teach the boy from beyond the grave. Always knowing that this lifestyle had the threat of an abrupt death. This book would provide him guidance in everything from warrior philosophy, to locations and contracts for every situation that might arise. Fett would take Slave One to Kamino, but saw that the Jedi had now infested the planet. And when he contacted Aura Singh, she turned him over to Darth Tyrannus, who wanted to ensure that the boy grew to be a powerful assassin loyal to him. Singh would be given the Slave One as a reward, but Boba would not stay the Sith's captive for long. A Republic attack on Rax's Prime to stop Dooku's use of the Force Harvester inadvertently gave the boy a chance to slip away, running into the arms of clone troopers, saved by those beings who shared his father's face. The Republic forces sent Boba to an orphanage on Bespin, where he could have spent years wallowing in obscurity if Aura Singh didn't come to the rescue. It was easy to make it seem like she thought that bringing the boy to Dooku was in his best interest, and he wouldn't understand this at the time, but she was just using him to access a large sum of credits that were in Jango's name, taking the boy directly from Bespin to a banking clan ruled planet of Argal. Here, the young Boba would be tricked by the changeling named Nuri, who impersonated a banking official to siphon off credits from naive visitors. The account that Boba received was likely in the millions, because what the Claudite took was 500,000 credits. This fraction was more than what most crooks would ever see in a lifetime. And though just a 10-year-old orphan, his instincts were good enough to make him suspicious of Singh. So after he got his credits, he was able to escape with the Slave One, and leave her behind before she was able to join in on the theft of his inheritance. Referring to his father's book, he saw that he could trust a certain Jabba the Hutt on the Outer Rim world of Tatooine, and set the coordinates to a place that he hoped to be able to call home. Here he would have a run-in with the Jendai bounty hunter Dirge, who wanted to wipe Mandalorians from the galaxy. But Jabba's patronage protected the boy at this incredibly vulnerable time, feeling a great gratitude towards Jango for taking out Gardula the Hutt, which helped Jabba to take complete control of Tatooine. Jabba's palace would act as a sort of home base for Boba for the rest of his life, often returning here in between contracts, and of course to get new bounties. But this is where he would hatch his plan to get revenge. Though he worried Singh might betray him, and he had once been captured by Bosk, he referred to his father's book of advice, seeking a way to win friends and influence killers. He knew not to take their betrayal too personal. It was only business in this new power vacuum without his father, and it was his responsibility to defend himself. And he also knew that these hunters would be motivated by credits, and that they did genuinely respect his father. While in Singh's case, they shared a burning hatred for the Jedi Order. These two agreed that they would help the boy kill Mace Windu, crafting a complex plan that would see the first clone created reunited with his clone brethren. 
Boba would infiltrate the Clone Youth Brigade and take the nickname Lucky. But when he gives his backstory, some of the other cadets call him a coward. A real trooper could lose an arm and still report for duty. So what are you, soft? Though one of the boys makes sure to stand up for him. So trooper's only as strong as the trooper beside him. We're all in it together, right? Right. When they arrive on the Venator Endurance, they are met by Anakin Skywalker and Mace Windu. Everyone's excited to be working with the Jedi, except for Boba, whose mind goes to a dark place upon seeing Mace. Their first task would be some target practice. And after cadet after cadet failed, Lucky steps up to show him how it's done, taking out the first target with a single shot, and then a trio of targets with ease. Accuracy that even surprises the gunner and admiral. After this, the cadets head out to their next task, but Boba finds a chance to slip off and contacts Singh to put their assassination plan into motion. Boba, is that you? It is. I'm sending you the data now. As he makes his way down the corridors, he bumps into a pair of clones, who seem to know that he's an imposter. You're lying. But they were just trying to scare him, and tell him that he was going the wrong way. Mace's quarters were in the other direction. He arrives at the location and gets to work placing a tripwire in the doorway. He completed the process, and as he makes his way back to the cadets, he bumps into the man that had killed his father just a few months ago. Though burning with rage, he is still able to control himself, expecting that he was just moments away from vengeance. It is only a trooper's persistence that saves the Jedi's life, urging Mace to report to a meeting immediately while he goes to place Mace's things in the room. The first step over the threshold would trigger the explosives, the blast consuming the quarters and sending shrapnel flying. Mace is safe and tries to save the life of the trooper, though he would succumb to his injuries. The first of Boba's unintended victims. He'd be able to make his way back to the cadets just in time to answer a question posed by his commander. No one detected his absence, providing him cover as the alarm sounds, and they all rush into position as the ship frantically tries to figure out what happened. Boba overhears the CO get a report that Windu had survived, and waits for a chance to break away and contact Singh for advice on what to do next. She says he must set the reactor to explode, and we see that he worries about the thousands of innocent lives on board. But the crew, it isn't about them, just Mace. If you want when you dead, do as I say. This is the first of many acts that would pull him away from his Mando code of honor, but the 10 year old Boba feels there is no other option. Once inside the main reactor, he is discovered by a trooper, who believes his story that he's just lost. And with a seemingly harmless interest in the blaster, the trooper hands it over to the lad while speaking on the comms. Boba knows this was the chance. He swings the rifle at the trooper's head, but it doesn't knock him out. So he follows up with another blow, which sends the clone to the ground, and the kid raises the blaster. We're brothers! Don't shoot! You're not my brother. He hates being compared to these clones. But still bound by honor, he did not kill the trooper, just stuns him, and proceeded to blast the control systems and reactor casings, before running back through the corridors and rejoining the cadets. The ship experienced critical system failures and was on a crash course for the planet Florum. The crew packs onto escape pods and jettisons off in all directions, and Boba was able to secretly cut off all the sensors, making their pod undetectable by Republic allies, while Boba still had a direct line to Aura Singh. Moments later, Slave One comes to intercept. Congratulations, Boba. The cadets are disgusted by their brother's betrayal, something they thought impossible. But we also see Boba is distraught. He still wishes to act honorably, as his father did. What do you think? Let them go? Uh, they're living witnesses, honey. Boba makes the difficult decision to send them off, upon Singh's intense urgings. Do it! And he presses the button to send the pod floating off into space while the hunters safely fly away on the Slave One. Luckily for the cadets, their pod is discovered by Mace and Anakin, saving the boys before their life support systems went out. And we see all of Boba's near-identical copies trying to process this betrayal. If he is like us, he'll realize he's wrong. And what was only a few months earlier, what now seemed like another life, Jango had killed a clone trooper who claimed that he and Fett were the same, proving that the clone was no true copy, not ruthless enough, and this mission would see Boba torn between a want to prove that he was as cutthroat as necessary, and yet still trying to honor his father's wishes for him to carry on the Mandalorian warrior code of honor. The following day, the Hunters would intercept Republic transmissions that the Jedi would be heading to the crash site in search of Admiral Killian, who went down with the Venator. After a lengthy search through the wreckage, Anakin sees a Mandalorian helmet in the command bridge. Curiosity consumes him and he moves to inspect it, but Mace is putting it all together. Boba. 
and at the last second, Mace calls on the Force to rip Anakin back as the blast goes off, the explosion consuming the bridge, while the hunters watched on from a nearby mountain range. Are you happy now? Instead of elation, the boy is still full of rage and wants to confirm his kill. I want to make sure he's dead. There's nothing left of Windu to find, Boba. Singh wasn't just less honorable, she was sloppy. His father always told him to never assume anything. As they head over to their ship, their hired hand Castus starts complaining about how hard this mission was, and shows he did not understand who exactly this boy was. You haven't even done anything! I've taken all the risks! Quiet, rot! Even though she had betrayed him plenty, Singh would not let Jango's son be disrespected by the likes of Castus. And when they discuss how much credits they would get for the Admiral and the officers, Boba points out that they could use this mission for vengeance to secure a nice paycheck as well. Count Dooku will pay us well if we bring back the Jedi's head. Dooku might pay us for killing Windu. In this interaction, we see the complicated relationships between Boba and Singh. She definitely is the more powerful one, ordering around Boba and Bosk, but she still recognizes his intellect and respects Boba's input. Neither she nor Bosk thought about how to get the most credits out of this mission. And so the hunters would race towards the Venator, while R2 was desperately trying to free the Jedi from the collapsed bridge wreckage. Mace and Anakin were pinned, and the astromech would have to fight his way out with an excellent display of droid creativity. These attacks by R2 force the hunters to leave, and when the droid tries to make it back to their starfighter to contact the council, a fight with a Gundark resulted in an explosion that alerted Boba. He thinks it must be the Jedi, so they jam all outgoing transmissions, forcing the astromech to take Mace's ship and try to make it back to Coruscant. The hunters scramble to intercept in the Slave 1, and R2 shows off some amazing piloting skills and his own droid intelligence, activating both hyperspace rings and drawing fire to the one while darting over to the other at the last second. I got you, Windu. No! Boba's accuracy was great, but this maneuver allowed R2 to escape. In Slave 1, we see that Boba is ready to take his rage out on Castus, and that Singh is still the one calling the shots saying that she could use these prisoners to make Windu come to them, but for now they need to flee. Moments later, we see Boba is still uncomfortable with this honorless mission. What was supposed to be vengeance has turned into indiscriminate killing and torturing of innocents. He goes to bring the captives water and explain that this was not his intention. This isn't what I wanted. I know a good soldier when I see one. I'm no soldier. I'm no clone, not like those two. What? What are you looking at? Boba. Jango worked hard to make his son understand that he alone would be his legacy, that Boba was unique, not just another one of those millions of mass-produced tools. He will never accept the assertion that they are brothers. Singh thinks that this was the perfect time to contact the Jedi and make their demands. Use the boy's rage at this comment to ensure that he will become a killer, pushing him to execute an innocent officer. Boba. Remember, Boba had killed before, and intended to kill, but those were for what he saw as honorable missions, taking out targets that had been contracted, sticking to his word and the warrior code. What Aura Singh saw as weakness, Boba knew he was keeping in line with the honorable Mandalorian way. In the temple, we see that Windu was ready to go challenge these hunters, but Plo steps in and says that he is the last person that should go. There would be no talking the boy out of this life, Windu's presence would only bring up the boy's sadness and anger. And in Slave 1, we see how furious Singh is with Boba. Next time I tell you to pull the trigger, you do it! They would make their way to Florum, home of the pirate king Hondo Onaka, who gives his condolences to Boba and shows how deeply many in the underworld respected his dad. Sorry about your father. He was a friend and an honorable man. As they make their way inside his cantina, we see that Singh still looks out for the boy's interests, stopping him from taking a drink. And when she overhears Krastus trying to betray them over a hollow call, she callously turns and blasts him. Boba's staring remorsefully. As annoying as the guy was, this was another death that he didn't want on his hands. Plo Koon would take Padawantano with him down to the lower levels of Coruscant, to a place known associates of Jango Fett would frequent. In the bar, Tano was able to calm her mind, and here's a criminal telling an associate how his friend was killed on Florum by Aura Singh. Now with their location, the Jedi race over, and when Boss gives them the heads up that the Jedi ship was inbound, Hondo tells Singh that he will neither help nor hinder her, before going out to greet these visitors. Plo is surprised to see the pirates selling out the hunters, but he knows that Aura Singh's own hatred for the Jedi has caused her to go on this rampage. He doesn't want her recklessness to bring down his pirate kingdom as well. Once the Jedi come in, the hunters spring their trap, but Boba is disappointed. 
I wanted Windu. What are you doing here? They argue over how to get Windu to show up, but Plo is adamant that this will not happen. I am prepared to kill you, the hostages, whatever it takes to get what Boba wants. Sounds more like what you want. And when Ahsoka springs the trap, Boba pleads with them to just give him Windu. I'm not a murderer, but I want justice. Though the two hunters would coordinate an attack that breaks them all up, Plo is able to use the force to call the boy into his arms. Boba desperately calling out for help to the only person he knew to turn to. Ara, help! Help me! Plo would ask the boy to do the right thing, but he is still stunned by this betrayal. If you do not tell us where those men are, they are going to die. Innocent men. She left me. Singh would race to the Slave One via speeder, with Ahsoka in hot pursuit, while Plo tries to invoke the aid of Hondo, the pirate calling on the legacy of the Mandalore. Why should I help anybody? I've got no one. It is the honorable thing to do. It's what your father would have wanted. Ahsoka had tracked the hunter to Slave One, freeing the prisoners and climbing onto the vessel as Singh tried to scramble away. The Jedi would draw a blaster fire to compromise the cockpit and then damage the wing, sending Jango's prized ship into a fiery crash landing. Back on Coruscant, Boba would be put in handcuffs and brought before his father's killer. Despite the emotions, this now 11-year-old warrior opens with taking some responsibility. I see now I've done terrible things. But you started when you murdered my father. I'll never forgive you. Well, you're going to have to. Callously simple, Windu does not try to lay into the boy's sense of guilt. He merely tells him, in a sense, to get over it. He and Bosk would be thrown into the same jail, and the bounty hunter that had risen to take his father's place as the best in the galaxy was there as well, Cad Bane. Kenobi was impersonating Racco Hardeen, and it is unclear if Boba knew this, but the real Racco Hardeen was a Mandalorian bounty hunter from his father's homeworld of Concord Dawn, and Cad Bane would have Boba fake a feud with Hardeen. This was all part of Bane's plan to create a prison riot to escape. The next time we see them, in the year 20 BBY, we see that Boba and Bosk were free men. And in Aura Singh's absence, Bubba was already highly respected and taken serious in the bounty hunting profession, which to Ventress was shocking to see. Boss, this is your boss. You got a problem with that? My name's Boba. The fallen Sith thinks this is ridiculous, but Bosk and Latsarasi convince her that she will work in this boy's crew. And note the confidence Boba displays. Prison, and this time in the bounty hunting profession, was already hardening Fett. What? You don't trust us? When the job's done, you'll get your cut, just like the rest of us. Ventress had killed one of Fett's associates that was planned to be in this six-person crew. And still not in possession of the Slave One, they traveled to the planet Corzite on Bosca's ship, the YV-666. This world had such great atmospheric pressure that all transport over the surface had to be restrained to tunnels, using a tram system. And these six hunters would be tasked with guarding a single chest containing some treasure, a motley crew that included the assassin droid Highsinger and Dengar, one who was also destined for bounty hunting fame. With their task explained to them, Boba makes sure that he starts to build that reputation for following his word. You make the rules, I follow them. They travel through the underground cave system with enormous glowing purple crystals and are set upon by the Kage warriors, ninja-like assassins who use their speed and strength to eliminate enemies. First, they would strike against Dengar and Ventress, some making their way into the train where they were blasted away by Boba, Highsinger, and Latsrazi. At only 12 years old, Boba Fett is blowing through these warriors with ease, using his father's Westar 34 blaster pistols and even some martial arts. Some of their tricks would work to send Bosk flying off the train, and their leader was able to outmaneuver Highsinger and Razi. Now only Boba remained. All the other Kage warriors were killed, but is shocked when their leader knocks over the chest to reveal its contents. Again, Boba finds himself in an unhonorable mission, and you can see that he truly wants to help the weak and innocent. What? <gasps> Don't worry, I'll protect you. He is taken aback and slapped by the girl, before the brother leaps over and knocks Boba out cold. But the Kage were wrong to have counted Ventress out. She makes her way back to the train and is able to best their leader, straining both he and the young girl that was inside the box. But this captive strikes a nerve with Ventress, giving her a flashback of her childhood, and then she gets into an intense argument with Boba over how they will split the credits. Boy. Boy, you have no idea who you're talking to. <laughs> you have no idea who you are talking to. Moments later, they would arrive at their destination. When Ventress hears that this sniveling creep was excited for the delivery of his bride, she was happy with the decision she made on the train. 
getting her payment up front. She clears it before he opens the chest to reveal a hogtied Boba Fett. The rest of the crew had made their way back to the orbital space station they arrived on, and Ventress gives the crew their pay, and says only that Boba will show up one day. From here, Fett would make his way back to Florum to reclaim and repair the Slave One, using the enormous scrapyard here, along with Hondo's connections, to get the iconic Fett ship up and running. A vessel that also contained his father's armor and various weapons. With these resources, he would complete a few smaller bounties, but felt lost in the galaxy, finding it difficult to grow his notoriety in this deadly profession. So he again returned to Jabba's palace, where he would come to befriend one of the cooks, Gab Boron, after rescuing his daughter Yagaba. Jabba gave him a mission in which he would compete against Dirge to kill a man named Gilramos Libcat, who was using orphans on Tatooine as an army of thieves, inserting a device into the orphans that would release a neurotoxin into the children if they disobeyed or left the planet. These children had surprised Boba and taken his helmet and weapons, leaving him only with a jetpack that was provided by the cook, Gabora. Dooku had hired Dirge to hunt down Boba, so though Dirge didn't want to go against Jabba's orders, he hoped to use the hunt for Gil Ramos to kill off Boba as well. And when they met at their target's base of operations, Boba was still weaponless. But his father trained him to never give up, and ply your entire mind to finding a solution. And so he would use his jetpack to fly at the Nymoidian slaver, snatching his cap, while drawing Dirge's fire positioning himself so that the bolts would strike a fuel cell as he exited, causing the ship to erupt, consuming Dirge, and killing the target, Gil Ramos's cap working as proof of this hit. And to repay Fett for freeing his daughter, Jabba's cook, who had once been an experienced armorsmith, helped Boba to resize his father's iconic suit of armor. This would be followed by the quick and easy bounty on the Nagri assassin named Jordvar, who when given the chance to be taken alive or dead, chose death and Jabba was thoroughly happy with this string of successes. Still in the blue and silver armor of the most notorious bounty hunter to ever live, Jabba's next assignment would be an incredibly dangerous and important mission, to kill the foreman of the Techno Union, Wat Tambor. This was in the year 19 BBY, the final year of the Clone Wars, and the death of this powerful CIS leader would prove a great victory to the Republic. But this was part of the problem as well. When Boba arrived in the Slave One, he saw the planet Zagobo was under full Republic invasion, forcing Fett to try and make his way past both CIS droids and GIR troops. While making his way through the fungal jungles, he runs into the changeling that had scammed him for his credits right after his father died, when he was trying to access Jango's accounts on that banking world. Nuri was now in the form of a snake and tried to strangle Boba, but he was able to throw him off and send him flying into a clump of neurotoxic fungus, finally getting his revenge after three years. But then Grievous showed up to the base where Wat Tambor was located, Grievous was once a Kalish warrior, another noble warrior people like the Mandalorians, and his cyborg enhanced body and four lightsabers proved too much for the young Fett. In the duel, he decides that the only way to survive would be to fake his death by falling into the Zabar fungus. When he regained consciousness, he was able to make it back to the ship and give pursuit to Grievous and Watt as they fled into space. But Ventress, who was on a mission of her own, came in and started blasting at the Slave One. Despite his great piloting skills, this would be another defeat. The damage would have blown the Slave One to pieces if it had not been for the accidental savior Anakin Skywalker, who came flying in to eliminate Ventress, allowing Boba to limp away in Slave One. An incredibly disappointing loss in his father's ship and his father's iconic armor. The Slave One couldn't even make it through hyperspace, instead setting down on a nearby moon. Skywalker followed the smoking ship down to the surface to learn more about this rogue that was trying to kill these high-ranking CIS leaders. And this would be the first time these two have a conversation, with Anakin offering help with the extensive ship repairs. Here, the Slave One and Boba's armor would get a repaint. He couldn't stand the idea that he had not only failed in his father's image, but that perhaps he might have diminished his father's legacy. Someone might have thought that this was Jango Fett based on the iconic armor and ship coloring. By running around the galaxy looking like his dad, he was getting an unfair boost, too easy of a reputation, while maybe even insulting his father's legacy. To be his own man, this green, red, and yellow paint job would be the look that Bobo would retain for the rest of his life, but one that also was a nod to Jango's old style, worn when he was just one of the lower ranking soldiers in the true Mandalorian faction several decades earlier. Despite Skywalker giving aid, he still wanted to bring Fett in for questioning and Boba thought he could use this to get close to his personal target, Jedi Master Mace Windu. He told the Jedi that he had information on how Lord Tyrannus was manipulating the Clone Wars, so Anakin told him where to rendezvous with Tarkin, who would escort Fett to the Jedi Temple. Once inside of the complex, he would find a way to sneak into Windu's personal quarters. 
Though his target was not home, he was able to learn that the Master was waiting for Palpatine in the office of the Supreme Chancellor. Here, Fett would ambush his target, turning the most important office in the galaxy into a battleground. After a long fight, neither were able to get the upper hand, and lay beaten and bloodied on the floor when the Chancellor came strolling in. Oddly not afraid of this sight, and telling the Jedi that this bounty hunter was here on orders to deliver crucial intel on the CIS. The Jedi Master was ordered to stand down and let Boba Fett be, while a similar order was given to Boba, allowing Windu to head back to the temple. He was furious at this missed opportunity, but knew this was the only ending to accept. Senate and Royal Guards ready to enforce these orders from the Chancellor. Boba, who was only 12 years old at this time, was pressed by Palpatine for the intel. But to Fett's surprise, the Chancellor says that he knew all along that Tyrannus was Count Dooku. He knew about his involvement in the Clone Army, and Palpatine even goes on to insinuate his own involvement in the Army's creation, commending his father Jango Fett for being such an excellent warrior, and promises Boba enormous sums of credit if he were to forget about this whole story, telling the boy that they shared a common enemy in the Jedi Order that his father had provided a great service to the Republic, and perhaps in the coming years, a new order would require the services of the son, Boba Fett. A short time later, Boba would hear about the Jedi's attempted coup, how his sworn enemy Mace Windu led the assault on the Senate, only to be slain in the process, denying Boba the vengeance that he had been seeking for three years. He would never be able to personally avenge the death of his father, a failure that would haunt Boba for the rest of his life. It is not certain if he would have known if this is a legitimate coup by the Jedi, or just the propaganda of the New Order that was calling itself the Galactic Empire, but everything seems to point to him being able to piece it together. His father did know that the clone's ultimate goal was to be used as tools to kill off all of the Jedi in the galaxy, and Boba's conversation with the Supreme Chancellor all but explicitly said that this man was a Sith like Tyrannus, with a burning rage similar to his to see the Jedi Order reduced to flames. And in this first year of the Imperial Era, Boba was now 13 years old, which happened to mark the start of adulthood in the Mandalorian tradition. He was now a man in a new era. And I think this would be a good place to pause. The epic life of Boba Fett has only just begun. Not sure how many parts this will be, but in this episode we went from the conditions before his birth, the immense responsibility that Jango put on Boba before he was even born, and how the greatest bounty hunter in the galaxy raised his son to take his place and perpetuate the true Mandalorian traditions. How Boba spent years trying to get vengeance, only to have it be denied, but having powerful allies like Jabba the Hutt and Emperor Palpatine. In the next videos, we'll see how Boba did indeed become the top hunter, but also how he tried to give it all up for a simpler Mando family life, only to be called back into the deadly profession, and at times fighting against Darth Vader, only to become his top enforcer and later going on to fight for his people, to come back to Mandalore to help these warrior people rise again, to fulfill his father's ultimate vision for him. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and comment about your thoughts on the Fett legacy, and subscribe to make sure you catch the next videos. You can help support this channel while picking up some cool Star Wars metal print art and free audible audiobooks. Links for all that is down in the description, where you can also find our Patreon and PayPal. A special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier, Chris Garcia, Cas Costello, Carlos Velez, and C7Go. But most important of all, remember, one of the deadliest things in the galaxy is a Mandalorian's word. And the Force will be with you. Always.